Warning, the following presentation is intended for mature audiences and it contains graphic descriptions of crime scenes, adult dialogue, and strong language. This podcast represents the opinions of the hosts and their guests, and every effort is made to ensure that information is accurate. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome fellow armchair detectives. I'm your host, Ashley Boitis. And I'm your host, Tamlin Rousseau. And And this this is Just in Crime. Crime. Join us as we explore the issue of gender-based violence and femicide in South Africa. By exploring the victims and their stories. Kamira Rajbushni was a bubbly, dynamic and well-liked 17-year-old that attended Woodview Secondary School. Shola and Bassoon also attended the school, and this is where the two would meet and eventually become high school sweethearts, until after two years of dating, Kamira broke it off. Unwilling to accept their breakup, Bassoon bludgeoned his former girlfriend with a frying pan, stabbed her in the chest, and dumped her body in a sugarcane field. This is the case of Kamira Rajbushni. Okay, kids. So buckle in because this this is quite a long case and today's case takes place in Phoenix. Phoenix is a township that is 25 kilometers northwest of Durban and also something interesting that I found while I was researching is that Phoenix is one of the oldest Indian settlements in South Africa. But anyway, Moving on, Phoenix is where Kamira Rajbushni attended Woodview Secondary School. She was described as a bubbly and well-liked person. Sholin Bassoon also attended the school, and this is where the two would meet and befriend each other. They met in 2010 when she was grade 9 and he was grade 12. The two became lovers, and it is said that they were inseparable from 2011 onwards. In early 2013, Bassoon said that he noticed slight changes in Kamira's behavior and he said that she was becoming distant. Bassoon said that he loved her unconditionally and he stated that he visited her daily and that he pretty much was part of the family. From October 2013, their relationship was rocked by a bunch of petty fights and arguments and Bassoon said he believes that this was happening because Kamira was suffering from depression and I just need to make a side note here. I'm like, I understand where he's coming from, but I don't like when people bring in mental illness and saying this is the cause. (laughs) And also, if you're not the one suffering, I don't really feel like you have a right to like really call someone out for it. Like those fights could have equally been both your fault and had nothing to do with her depression. Yes, she could have been depressed, but you could have also just been a less than adequate boyfriend at the time. I could not say it any better myself, but yeah, basically relationship ended the 2014 January. This is when things were like done. Kamira basically just said that she wanted some space and that is the reason that they broke up. And at this point, all communication between the two was stopped and Kamira deleted Bassoon on BBM. Oh my gosh, BBM even. Blackberry Messenger, the OG of social media sites. Oh, don't Um, lie. We had Mixit before. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Okay, so the second OG (laughs) of social media. Your dude and you know those those blackberry um those bbm breakups they really do hit hard when they remove your name from their status suddenly you're deleted blocked you need to get their pin from someone else it's a mess yeah no honestly all all around not a great time but on the 24th of february kamira contacted bassoon as she invited him to join her family to pray with them on the 27th of february as this was a hindu holiday called shiva On the morning of the 3rd of March, 2014, the two had a heated exchange. Kamira accused Bassoon over BBM that he was stalking her and that she was, and he was being too nosy. 
The scene then went to Kamira's home in order to have a face-to-face -face conversation. He basically got to the house, went inside, the two hugged, and they just had a conversation about some just general superficial topic. Um, also, keep in mind that at this point, Kamira is 17 years old and still in school, and Basun is a 22-year-old IT student. But at some point in this visit, Basun came across Kamira's personal diary, and he read its contents. So, I just want to ask, like, why would you read someone's journal? I don't think anything good can come from reading someone's personal diaries, because honestly, sometimes you just don't want to know those thoughts. But also, I could find someone's journal with a little tag on it that said, Ashley, please read me. And I still wouldn't. Like, why would you invade someone's property like that? Their privacy. And at the end of the day, you're just going to upset yourself because... What this person is writing in this journal isn't necessarily what is like reality. This is their inner dialogue. This is what they believe. This is how they view the world and their perspective on things. So I'm just like, you're really stupid if you want to read someone's diary. But anyway, you're going to get your own feelings hurt. So <laughs> don't tell me I didn't warn you. <laughs> 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 so, moving on. Just a side note as well. He was literally out here being accused of being nosy and stalking Kamira. And the behavior that he's taking part in, honestly, it's just not helping his case. But anyway, he reads her diary and does not like what he reads. Her entries were about how she had conflicting emotions about him and that she had a crush on someone else while they were dating. At this point, Basun goes into a full-blown rage and he bludgeons Kamira's head with a frying pan and then he continues to stab her several times in the chest with a sharp instrument that he got from the kitchen. After murdering Kamira, Basun loaded her body into his father's white Toyota Fortuna and sped to a secluded area and then proceeded to savagely dump her body in the water in a sugarcane field. Okay, so I just want to make sure I heard this right. He murdered her because she had a crush on someone else. She wasn't even freckle frackling with anyone else. She was just a crush. Yeah, just a crush. And he got this um, information from her personal diary. But dude, also, like, I'm 22 now and I look at 17-year-old girls and I'm like, oh, you're literally, you have a crush on everyone. Like, literally any boy that walks past could be the one. <laughs> but I mean, like, you should understand that. And also, it's just a crush. Like, let it go. Honestly, a crush is so harmless. Like, who of us don't have some type of celebrity crush? Like, honestly, let's not lie. I mean, Jason Moma hit me up. <laughs> Johnny Depp, you oh, can yum. you can come act some Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> I'd appreciate. But anyway, so, serious, back to it. So, obviously, Bassoon dumped Kamira's body, and it's unclear whether she was still alive when her body was dumped. And after murdering someone who he apparently loved so dearly and cared so much for, he just proceeded with his day as normal. He picked up his mother from Phoenix Plaza. He updated his Facebook status. So just very blasé. But that isn't the end of the story. Who figured out Kamira was missing? Well, let me tell you, as she's still a minor and a scholar, she lived with her mother and her sister. Her mother had left work the, in the morning and then arrived home at half past five, which is a very normal time to arrive home after a long day's work and sitting in traffic. So when she arrived home from work, the scene could only be described as utter chaos. She noticed her daughter was not there and nobody knew where she was. The gates and doors were left wide open and she further discovered a broken frying pan, broken glass, a bloody mop and blood stains that had tr been tried to clean up in the house. And this obviously just made her incredibly suspicious. Another discovery that was made is that Kamira's phone was still at home and it contained threatening messages. And Obviously, her mother becomes frantic, as any parent would, when she realized that her daughter, who was alone at their Woodview home for the day, was nowhere to be found. Kamira's mother made many inquiries about where she could be and her disappearance. After getting no answers, she reported the matter to the Phoenix police station. 
A case of kidnapping was opened and an eight-man team of detectives immediately began investigating while the family used social media to request information on Kamira's whereabouts. The family didn't want to believe that Bassoon could have been involved in her disappearance, but they did suspect that he knew something. Police spokesperson Captain Tulani Zwane said that it had appeared that the couple had broken up two weeks prior to her disappearance and they had been fighting about it. He also further said that Bassoon had someone stalk her on social networks and he was very possessive over her. The next day, police questioned Bassoon and a day later on the 5th of March, Bassoon, accompanied by his attorney, handed himself over to police and did a pointing out where he voluntarily showed the police where Kamira's body was. Her bloodied and lifeless body was then discovered in a pool of water in a Glen Annul sugarcane field. And... I just want to touch on what a pointing out is because I learned this the other day and it's really very interesting. So basically a pointing out is something that's very unique to South Africa in terms of what we do and how we do it. So often when a suspect is cooperating, it's then that they would be asked if they would be willing to do a pointing out. So it essentially is just where a person agrees to take an unbiased officer who's unfamiliar with the case to whatever location he wants to show the person. And during this time, usually what is found is um, bodies, murder weapons, etc., etc. Um, I actually read about this in a book about one of our like top detectives in South Africa, um, Pete Bellefeld. I don't think he's a detective anymore. I think he's retired. But he was speaking about this process of the pointing out and he was saying there have been so many on there where you're basically specifically trained to not judge the person so that they can give you as much information as possible. And apparently they get a lot out of that other than like um, the evidence and the body and um, other things that might have been left at the crime scene. They also get, I think, some deeper insight to how the situation played out and also um, basically like what um, the person, what motivated them to do what they did. So the motives behind it. Yeah, I think a pointing out is definitely a very interesting way of um, finding out what happened. But on a completely different note, um, when we look at this situation, it's a classic case of intimate partner femicide. And when this type of femicide occurs, there are four types of violence that can be perpetrated by intimate partner. And these just include stalking, sexual violence, physical violence and psychological ag aggression. And South Africa definitely has the highest reported intimate femicide rate in the world. And to put that in perspective, a case of intimate femicide violence happens every eight hours. And these are excluding the cases that are not reported. As if this is not tragic enough, 62% of women that experience intimate partner violence also test positive for HIV and AIDS. But back to the murder. Bassoon confessed to killing Kamira in a fit of rage and then dumping her body in a sugarcane field near a river in Glenanul. He was set to appear in the Virulam Regional Court a few days later. Kamira's mother, Sunita, and her sister, Ashmika, were hopeful that Kamira would be found alive. Despite what they found at home, they believed that she would be all right. But when they heard the news, they were absolutely devastated. A family member stated, that the family did not wish to comment as the case was ongoing. The family member that was identified as Nolan said, I really wish I could describe what we're going through now, but I can't. Someday we will want to say something about this, but today we just can't. Kamira's friends took to a Facebook memorial page to express their grief, shock and disgust over the murder. Some said they never liked her former boyfriend and called for him to be sentenced to life behind bars, while others described Kamira as a bubbly and very well-liked person. And I just quickly want to stop again, but this time at the Facebook memorial page. 
So from what I've gathered, this page was created by one of Kamira's cousins and within a few days, the page had over 1,200 likes. And at the current moment, or rather the last time I checked, there are 6,358 likes on the page. So if you want more information about the court proceedings, poems from relatives, and just general information, I would genuinely recommend that you go check out this page. It's called In Loving Memory of Kamira Rajbushni. And I just want to give a huge shout out to her cousin for starting this page and keeping it so well updated throughout all the proceedings. Back to the case. Kamira's funeral was held on the 7th of March 2014 at her residence and then later moved to Stanmore Hall in Phoenix. And then lastly, it proceeded to the Clare Estate Crematorium. More than 200 friends and family members attended her funeral. One of her friends gave a moving tribute describing Kamira as someone who was never afraid of standing up for her beliefs. As mourners paid tribute and their respect, her mother just sobbed. And I think it's incredibly tragic that a mother had to bury her daughter. Like that is absolutely insane. But before we jump into the court proceedings, be sure to check us out on Instagram and Facebook at Just In Crime SA for more episodes, case related content, updates and other riveting content. Also, always keep in mind, we are not professionals in any of the discussed fields. If you or anyone you know is in danger, you can find resources on our social media pages, or alternatively, you can contact the Gender-Based Violence Command Center at 0800-428-428 or SMS HELP to 31531. Bassoon's appearances in the Magistrate's Court takes place over nine court appearances and it's really, to say the least, it's very complicated. So I'm going to try and take all of the proceedings from the Magistrate's Court and just put it into like a bite-sized type of understandable version. Also, keep in mind that during all of this, Bassoon was in custody at the Durban Westville Prison and Ash just informed me that that is apparently a hectic one. Yeah, like obviously no tea, no shade to the correctional officers and the people who, I guess, help maintain it. I know you're probably trying your best, um, but I've heard some, just some rumors and you know, not a high re- like high ratings. I would give you guys like one out of three stars on TripAdvisor. <laughs> Okay, so definitely not the best. Um, But Bassoon appeared in the Varula Magistrates Court in March on charges of kidnapping and murder. Bassoon was accused of stabbing his estranged girlfriend and dumping her body near a river in Glen Annol. In a plea statement read out in court, Bassoon admitted to attacking Rajbushni at her home on the morning of the 3rd of March after reading parts of her diary in which she apparently admitted to having feelings for someone else. The court heard that Kamira was stabbed six times in the chest and was subjected to extreme violence. The state, represented by Prosecutor Carlson Governor, claimed that the murder was planned and executed with horrific violence. The state further alleged that Bassoon could not accept their breakup, therefore he bludgeoned Kamira's head with a frying pan and then stabbed her six times in the chest before dumping her body in a river. Warrant Officer Pat Moodley testified that Kamira's sister and mother were afraid that Bassoon may harm them if he were released. The defense alleged that Bassoon experienced an emotional explosion and snapped when he discovered that his girlfriends had feelings for someone else while they were dating. He further stated that the murder was not planned and that Bassoon was overcome at the time by temporary mental incapacity. Bail was requested and Bassoon said his mental well-being would suffer and his defense would be compromised if he was not released on bail because he was traumatized by the killing and required urgent professional treatment, which he did not think would be provided efficiently behind bars. Bassoon said it's difficult to consult freely in prison. The conditions in prison are shocking. I fear I may be afflicted with tuberculosis. I'm scared. To prepare adequately for my trial, I require easy access to my attorney and expert witnesses, such as a psychiatrist and psychologist. He further said that he had no reason to flee as his entire family lived in Phoenix and he did not have a passport. Um, sounds like fake news. Like, you would definitely... Like, 
I would never be in the situation because I'd never like be in a, like circumstances that allowed for it. But straight up, I would try and flee. <laughs> like most people, I think have at least the thought. And you can also get a passport. Like, do you know if it says you can't get a passport? I, I mean, don't think so. <laughs> exactly. I don't think so. But in an affidavit to support his bail application, Bassoon said he visited Rajbushni at her Phoenix home but could not remember what happened after he found her diary in which he discovered her feelings for someone else during their relationship. Everything happened in a blur, he said. Um, he said his actions were involuntary and at the time he was incapable of appreciating the wrongfulness of his actions. I just need to stop here for 2.5 seconds because, wow, you can just hear the coaching. <laughs> like, Bassoon's lawyers must have been really good because they really, really coached him very well. And I'm just saying that he was coached because I don't know many 22 year olds which could put like who could put like that wording together I mean you would have sworn that his lawyers were also copywriters on the side like it is literally so practiced literally no one speaks like that well I mean obviously I don't like the side his lawyers are on but they did a very good job um like give credit where credit is due but basically, long story short, the state opposed bail on grounds that there was a public outcry, outcry following the murder and that Bassoon's life was also at risk. Investigating officer Pat Moodley testified that at least 7,000 messages of outrage were posted on a Facebook tribute page. He said Bassoon's Facebook profile was bombarded with over 100 messages, including several death threats. On the 25th of March 2014, Magistrate Visha Naidu rejected Bassoon's bid for freedom in the Varula Magistrates Court. In denying bail, Magistrate Naidu said, Bassoon used extreme violence on his ex-girlfriend after she told him their relationship was over. Bassoon was not prepared to accept that his relationship with Kimura was over. Bassoon also took her diary, which contained words which triggered the murder. He did not hand himself over, but waited for two days to pass before he did so. Therefore, bail is refused. Yes, thank you, justice system. You got something right. Yes. So, as proceedings continued, Kamira's diary was submitted as an item of evidence. Entries from the diary were read out to the courts. Heart-wrenching excerpts of the murdered teen's thoughts gave the court insight to the inner struggle that young Kamira faced with her conflicting emotions regarding Bassoon and her current love interest at the time. In Bassoon's plea statement, which was also read out, he admitted to attacking Kamira in her home on the morning of the 3rd of March after reading part of her diary in which she apparently admitted to having feelings for someone else, but he denied stabbing her. Bassoon said in his plea, After I completed matric and while the deceased was still at school, we became lovers. From 2011, we were inseparable. From early 2013, I noticed a slight change in her as she was becoming more distant. Despite this, I loved her unconditionally. I visited her almost every day, spending several hours in her company. I was treated like a member of the family. You were treated like a member of the family, but you killed her. And That's also, I think it kind of speaks to his overpowering and protective nature. There is no reason that a 17-year-old girl needs to see her boyfriend every day. Focus on my trick. Like... You were there. You were part of a family because you literally forced yourself there. Probably no one even invited you. Like, they might have liked your company, but you were just always there. Well, I mean, earlier her mother and her sister did say that they are scared of Bassoon. Mm. So interesting. But from October 2013 until late December... He said that his and Camaro's relationship was punctuated by petty fights. She behaved abnormally, and that she had depression. And that she had depression. That whole spiel and my little mistake, but it's fine. You're not going to redo it. No. Okay. <laughs> um, our relationship ended in January 2014 when she told me she wanted some space. All communication between us stopped. She deleted me on BBM. In February, she contacted me and we decided to spend time together on Shiva. He then said how on the morning of the incident, they had a heated exchange about Kamira's communication with another male known as Dylan. 
I found her private diary and read part of the contents thereof. This triggered off an emotional explosion. I can't remember precisely what happened thereafter. Everything happened in a blur. After I read that, while going out with me, she had true feelings for somebody else. My conduct subsequent to what happened in the kitchen was driven by panic and fear. I loaded her body into my father's vehicle and drove to a secluded area near Mount Edgecombe and dumped her body in a pond. I then fetched my mom and went to Phoenix Plaza. On March the 5th, I surrendered myself to the Phoenix Police Station and I did a free pointing out where I showed police where the deceased bodies were deceased body was. In aggravation of sentence, senior state advocate Cheryl Naidu led the evidence of Kamira's sister who testified that the accused was a possessive and controlling person who did not allow Kamira any access to social media. She even mentioned that her sister had to send pictures of the clothes that she was wearing before she went out so that Bassoon could approve the outfit and he just monitored her life in that way. So, while Bassoon claimed that reading the diary made him very angry, he was in a fit of rage when he committed the murder. The state proved that this was not a substantial and compelling reason to commit the offence. Bassoon was sent for assessment of mental incapacity. It was said that these results would be revealed at the next hearing, as the state prosecutor would round up the case and forward the matter to the Durban High Court, where sentencing would take place the 5th of December 2014. So, it's the morning of the 5th of December 2014, and we have moved from the Varula Magistrates Court to the Durban High Court, where a haggard-looking bassoon stood somberly in the dock of the Durban High Court as his defense attorney notified the court of his change of plea. His attorney approached the court and informed Judge Gianda, my client wishes to change his plea to guilty. Bassoon pleaded guilty in the Durban High Court to killing Kamira at her home in Forestwood Gardens on the morning of the 3rd of March. In his written guilty plea, which was submitted by his attorney, Bassoon admitted that he had gone to see her to talk to her about the relationship, which by then obviously had already ended. He also explained how he had known her from their school days at Woodview Secondary School from 2010 and that he was so deeply in love with her, he could not handle the eventual breakups. And Judge Kianda looked at the, fe- the defense attorney and Bassoon and replied, the case will be remanded for 13 April 2015 for sentencing, barely making any eye contact. The then convicted bassoon remained in an almost cold, emotionless silence following Judge Gianda's ruling. Bassoon immediately left the courtroom, escorted by police officers of the court through a back room to avoid public exposure. It was said that further investigations would continue while awaiting the next court appearance, which was set to take place on the 13th of April 2015. And until then, Bassoon remained behind bars at the Durban Westville Prison. Kamira's sister, Ashmika, told the Daily News later that although the family were happy with the guilty plea, they would wait for sentencing before finding closure. The court hearing on the 13th of April 2015 stated that the case had been adjourned to the 12th of May 2015. It was on this day that 22-year-old murderer accused Sholin Bassoon of Woodview, north of Durban, was sentenced to 12 years of imprisonment for the murder of 17-year-old Kamira Rajbunsni in March of the previous year. Bassoon said he was sorry for his actions. The Durban High Court, which sent him to prison, had harsh words for Bassoon and other men who regard their girlfriends and wives as shuttles or possessions. Judge Gianda said, Women's organizations have been campaigning for years that the inferior treatment of women by men should be consigned to the scrap heaps. He said Bassoon was overpowering and controlling towards Kamira. She did what he told her. Women should not be regarded as possessions by men. In black culture, including Indians and coloreds, men who have girlfriends and wives think it is fine to set eyes on other women. However, when women do it, then it is deemed a problem. In the past few days, I read of three women who were stabbed to death by their spouses. Such crime is prevalent and on the increase, said the judge. 
After being sentenced, Bassoon was very saddened by this tragic event. I wish to say unconditionally how sorry I am to Kamira's family and my family for the pain, anguish, grief, and trauma that I created. I loved Kamira very much. I regret acting violently. The IT student said he wanted to complete his studies in prison and to be and to come out a better person. Bassoon's apology, however, has been rejected by Kamira's family. Her sister, Ashmika, who testified in aggravation of sentence, said Bassoon had not shown one iota of remorse and had not apologized to her or her family personally. She said, never once did he apologize to us. His family can visit him in prison. My sister is not coming back. Sholin aborted her life. My family and I are not happy with the sentence imposed. We are of the view that he should have gotten a stiffer sentence. Ashmika described Bassoon as being controlling and possessive towards her sister. My sister and Sholin were very were happily in love at one stage, but after Kamira asked him for a cooling off period, he did not like that idea. Sholin killed her after he saw and removed her diary from our home. Kamira told me before she was murdered that she had a crush on someone else. That was stated in her diary. She told me she did not meet or communicate with this person before, but her wish was to have a better relationship compared to the one she had with Sholin. Judge Gianda criticized Bassoon's mother for shielding her son. He said, even after he pleaded guilty, the accused mother said he was with her the whole day. Only a mother can say this. When mothers shield their children involved in crime, it does not help to reduce the crime levels, he said. Attorney Roger Nathalal, acting for Bassoon, told the court that his client had learned his lesson from the crime of passion. And just to close off the case, I'd like to share some words from Kamira's mother. So this is a letter that she, I'm assuming, wrote to Kamira. On the 29th of March, 1996, I gave birth to a gorgeous bundle of joy. The first time I held you in my arms, that moment was priceless. I loved you with all my heart. I nurtured you from birth to the young lady you turned out to be. Having lost dad, as a single parent, I disciplined, guided, and made sure you grew up in the ways of me. Your first day at school, holding your hand, telling you that was going to be okay. Till the last day at high school, when you matriculate with an exceptional pass, you told me you wanted to study computer science. We applied at UKZN and you got accepted to fulfill your dreams, baby. You made me so proud. I never in a lifetime thought you would be robbed from me, Kamira. My world is shattered. I miss you every single day, every minute, every hour, and every second, more than words can explain. But still, you're gone. Nothing's going to change that. You are never coming back. And this ache I feel in my heart will never heal. I love you and always will till we meet again. So, dude, what do you think about the case? Oh, my gosh. I just have so many opinions. I even had to write them down. <laughs> just so, so many. Okay. So, I just wanted to bring this up as just like our first talking point. Um, so basically she is so young. She's so, so young. 17 is basically a baby. And I mean, we keep seeing, have you noticed how so many of our cases are coming out and we keep saying intimate partner violence, intimate partner violence, intimate partner violence, because like every single case or not every single case, but a large majority of it tends to be like that. And it's so sad that someone literally who's 17 should have had to basically deal with that i also feel like i just want to give a quick shout out here um her cousin with the memorial page so in the previous episode of ashika her family also started a memorial page and i just want to say to anyone who's kind of gone out and done that for these victims you i don't think you understand how big of an impact that makes sometimes that is the only thing that comes up when we are looking for the cases to cover is a Facebook memorial page um, created by a friend or close family member. And yeah, it's really a really beautiful way to, I guess, just... Commemorate some. Yeah. So to everyone who's done that, I guess, just thank you. And oh, my last point, and I feel like I have a lot of opinions on this. What 
is a 22-year-old doing with a 17-year-old? That is a very good question. And I know, I know, some of you are going to say that's not a big age difference. And granted, it's not. But when you look at the mindset of a 17-year-old and the mindset of a 22-year-old, it's two very different things. If they were much older, let's say in their 20s, and this was the case, that would have been fine because, again, we are looking at mindset. What is a 22-year-old, pretty much man, doing with a 17-year-old girl? What is the intention? And I mean, like when you look at these girls who are approached by older men, I don't want them to think that it's their fault at all. There's nothing that these girls are doing wrong. Um, it's honestly just, I guess, a really messed up society. But... When a guy is so many years older than you and he's approaching you, especially when you're in school and he's telling you he likes you because you're mature for your age, uh, as hard as it might be to hear, it's not. You're not mature for your age. You're probably just 17 and you're allowed to be and you shouldn't be expected to be more mature. But these guys are. They should be more mature to understand that the situation is not okay. Like, Everyone thinks that like pedophilia and grooming is like an old man in a van um, who's going to steal some child from outside of school. But it's not. It's also these 24 year olds who are going out and hitting on 16 year old girls. Like it's much deeper than that. It's again, this culture of, I guess, hypersexualizing and um, basically like objectifying. objectifying younger girls, which is really, really sad. It's really, really scary. And it's also one of the main things that basically contributes towards violence against women. And lastly, I just want to add in, we're not criticizing anyone who is in a relationship with an age gap. And because they are, they genuinely are people who were high school sweethearts and now are very happily married with the family, etc. So obviously this is very much case specific, but just in general, just be cautious, but we're not shaming anyone like in any way. Like we're very happy for you if things worked out for you. But otherwise, mm, just have your guard up. And I promise that if he's the one, you can wait till you're out of school. You can definitely, definitely wait. So, yeah, I think that's all for today's case. Okay, and that's a wrap on episode six, which means we're done for today. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. Be sure to check out our social media for more episodes, case-related content, and other riveting info. We'd also like to give a massive shout out to Christian Putter for creating our theme song. Be sure to check out more of his work on Instagram at Christian underscore Putter. And then we would also just like to thank Anthony Catano for creating our album art. So be sure to follow him at Ant Catano on Instagram. And lastly, we'd like to give a huge shout out to VU Media for helping produce this podcast. Be sure to follow them on Facebook and Insta at VU underscore Media SA. 